Welcome everybody, my name is Tim Sandy and I'm a Cohesity Systems Engineer. In this video, I'm going to walk you through the interface of our uh, Cohesity user interface and this is version 6.5, which is our latest release. So again, I'm going to do a walkthrough and kind of cover the entire interface covering most of the aspects of what we can do in the interface. I'm going to show you how to create some policies and protection jobs, as well as connecting to sources, doing a recovery of a VM or a file, as well as a cloning. So I'm basically going to go through everything within the interface. So without further ado, I'd like to get started. So as you can see here, our Coacity interface has on the left-hand side a navigation pane, which is where we're going to predominantly work from. In the upper right-hand corner, uh, we do have a new feature, which is called uh, dark mode. So we can enable that by clicking on the little half moon there, and we can go to dark mode, which I kind of like. This is becoming very popular. We also have a help icon here to where we can go out to our uh, documentation page related to this version of the interface. We also have um, where we can connect to Helios in this lab environment. I won't be doing that, but Helios is basically our SaaS version of this interface. So for large organizations that have multiple city clusters globally throughout either just the United States or globally throughout the world, they can manage all of their clusters from a single interface, as well as it does uh, add some additional capabilities from our Helio SaaS interface. You will get every time a job completes, you will see the information here showing, there'll be a red number here showing that, you know, yes, either a backup job had completed successfully or not. You also have the admin profile, which is what I'm logged in as a default admin. One thing about our interface is our, we are a cloud native type modern platform. So our user interface is all HTML5 driven. You can use it from any HTML5 compatible web browser, which is basically all of them now, as well as we also are completely API driven. Anything that we can do in this interface, we can also manipulate using our API. So for example, if you're using an automation tool such as VMware's vRealize Automation, you can call our APIs to do some of this stuff in an automated fashion. From a configuration standpoint, we have this gear icon here for settings. If I click on that, you're going to see that we have an option for targets. If I click on targets, we have an option for remote clusters. So in this environment, we have two Cohesity clusters, essentially. And uh, as you can see already here, we're already connected to that remote Cohesity O2 cluster. We are currently in the interface for Cohesity O1. So we've already made that connection for a remote cluster. When we do that in both directions, so if I go to Cohesity 02 in that interface, go again to settings, target remote clusters, you can see that this is connected to the Cohesity 01 interface as well. So back to Cohesity 01, next up uh, is external targets. We can register various different types of external targets. So if I click on register external targets, we can do that for either archive purposes. So for example, long-term archive. So many of our customers will do say 30 days of local retention on the local physical cluster on-prem, and then maybe their monthly and annual protection jobs will be uh, archived off to say an Azure blob storage or maybe AWS Glacier for long-term storage. That's archival. We can also tier. Tiering is more extending our file system out into the cloud so that we can extend that file system out there. So if you're getting tight end space in your on-prem physical cluster and you don't have the money to get additional expansion nodes to increase your storage, you can tier out our file system out into the cloud. Main three cloud providers that you'll see here is AWS, Azure, GCP, but then we also integrate with, as you can see here, Oracle. We can also connect as an external target to some generic NAS, QSTAR tape. So if you're running a tape system, we use QSTAR to integrate with us in order to write and send that off to tape, as well as there are cloud providers out there doing just generic S3 compatible storage, so we can connect to them. If you notice from the archival for AWS, we have a lot of different options for different S3 types of buckets. 
Azure, uh, we have hot, cold, and archive blobs. GCP, you have a couple different options. Now, when you go to tiering, tiering is different. So there is a difference in the options as you see here. There's limited options for when you're doing tiering. As you can see, now we only have S3 and S3 Intelligent uh, storage out of AWS. So as you can see, we can do that and then the connection in between those external targets and the on-prem cluster being encrypted as well as doing compression. So that's how easy it is to connect to an external target. And those are the different options. So next up, let's go look at the cluster. So we're going to look at, we're going to go settings, cluster, and then we're going to go to summary. So summary is just that. It gives us a nice summary. What is our cluster name, our cluster ID? So if you're talking to support, they may ask you what your cluster ID is. They don't know. It shows you what software version we're on, what type, um, whether encryption is enabled or not, how many storage domains, how many nodes in the cluster. This is essentially a virtual edition uh, that we're running here in this demo environment. Support channels on or off, storage capacity. We also have storage domains. Now, Cohesi as a whole, we, for the cluster, so if you have a cluster and say a primary site, a DR site, and in the cloud, we can dedupe and compress across all of them. However, our dedupe and compression ratios are per storage domain. So although we can do it across the entire cluster, if for some reason you need to add an additional storage domain, for example, if uh, say maybe you were a service provider and you needed to accommodate multi-tenancy uh, to ensure that nobody has access to each other's data, you could create separate storage domains. And then again, if you do separate storage domains, we cannot dedupe across all the storage domains. It's per storage domain. Then nodes, as you can see here, it shows the nodes. Again, some additional information, the node ID, the IP, the release, and it's active. Key management system. If you need to use a key management system, we can um, use a KMAP compliant KMS server. You can use internal as well as uh, we have a couple of different options when it comes to this now, as well as AWS. So then go to cluster and then access management. So local users and groups, as well as our roles. One thing I'd like to mention specifically, the admin and the data security role. Admin gives you full access to everything to do in the interface with the exception of one thing that data security gives you. So we have the ability to do data lock and legal hold. How you wanna look at this is think of a very large organization that has a security officer, a CISO. You would give them that data security role, whereas your normal backup admins and everybody else, you would give the admin role. And what that does, that data security role and whoever has that role is the only one that has the ability that can create data lock views uh, as well as expiration dates for the data lock views and the legal hold as well as remove them. Okay, so that's a distinct difference. Next up, we directly integrate with Active Directory. So you can connect to Active Directory and put your QEC cluster on Active Directory. And what that enables us to do is through using role-based access or RBAC with Active Directory, we can set up, again, with those roles, very specific user login capabilities to where, for example, your database administrators, they only have the permission to back up and restore databases. Or maybe your developers, they have only the ability to back up and do restores for your test dev environment. Help desk uh, can do only file level restores only, but they can't do backups. You can get very granular with the RBAC rules. We also integrate with LDAP outside of Active Directory. You can use single sign-on as well. So next up, we have networking. Networking here shows that what bonds that we have, if we have any VLAN set up, and the way it works for Cohesity is we have our physical node IP as well as a virtual IP per node. And the reason for that is if a node goes down, that virtual IP will move. So here's the information related to that. Uh, also, we have some firewall settings here as well. You can also set up SNMP. So if you're using a monitoring tool that's using SNMP traps, you can set that up. From an upgrade perspective, the great thing about the Cohesity 
solution is that we do non-disruptive upgrades. So when there's a new long-term supported upgrade or another upgrade that's available, you can simply get new package. You can either point to the download URL from our support page, or if you've already downloaded the file itself, you can upload it by clicking on that, selecting the file and uploading. And like I said, it's non-disruptive. It does it in a rolling fashion per node. It'll complete the upgrade on the node and then move on to the next one. What that means by non-disruptive upgrades is that you're able to continue during production hours to do backups, restores, everything can run in the middle of doing a software upgrade. And our software upgrade upgrades everything from firmware to software versions. Forwards, when you first log in, you're going to hit this summary dashboard, which gives you just a nice overview of health storage, uh, the reduction from dedupe and compression, the protection, compliance, performance. Now keep in mind, this is a demo environment that I just spun up. So the, the colors and the amount of data is not going to be too interesting in this demo. We have several dashboards available, but let's go on to data protection. I'd like to go to sources. We can have multiple types of sources connected. As you can see here, we have two virtual centers that we're connected to, two VMware environments. But if you click on this plus sign here, you can see that we have options for hypervisor. So if we go to hypervisor, you can see that obviously we have vCenter, but then you have a standalone ESX. You also have vCloud Director. We also integrate with a Hyper-V, Acropolis, also AWS Azure and GCP, as well as Red Hat Virtualization. So those are your options for hypervisors. Going back here again, we also can connect to a physical server. Now, just as a side note, when you use our agent to give you some granular capabilities for such as SQL, Oracle, Active Directory servers, we actually first connect to them as a physical server and then register them as the appropriate. So we'd register an Active Directory server as a physical and then say register as Active Directory or register as physical and then uh, register as a SQL server. We also can protect Office 365. In this version also in beta, we also can do OneDrive. In our next release, uh, OneDrive will be full GA as well as we we'll, should be able to do SharePoint Online. As you can see, we can also do a source for a physical SQL server as well as a virtual, an Oracle server, a generic storage array and NAS, storage snapshot provider, and then as I mentioned earlier, Active Directory. For example, register an Active Directory domain controller so that I can create a protection job and protect the Active Directory database. First thing I'm going to do, now this particular workstation that I'm on in this environment happens to be the domain controller. I'm going to download the Coesity agent. It's going to be for Windows. It's going to download that. And I'm going to very quickly install our agent onto the domain controller, which happens to be, again, this particular VM. I'm just going to click Next. Now, normally you would want to do change block tracking. So then that way, when we do a full and then we do incrementals, we're only doing those very, very small differences between the last backup and the current one. Now, just to let you know, in order to enable CBT, you do have to reboot it. I'm not going to do it in this particular demo, but normally I would select that, reboot the domain controller during a maintenance window, and then we'll be able to connect to it. So very quickly, again, I'm not going to restart. I'm not going to worry about change block tracking for this particular demo. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead, click the plus sign. And again, when we use our agent, we're going to first register as a physical server. I'm going to put in the domain controller FQDN, our fully qualified domain name, and I'm going to register it. So once it's been registered as a physical server, so again, this is a domain controller. I'm going to go over to the three dots here, click on that, and then I'm going to say register as Active Directory. Now, if this was a SQL server, even if it was a virtual SQL server, we'd first register as a, as a physical server, and then we would select MS SQL server. But in this case, it's Active Directory, so we're going to say register as Active Directory. And as you see now, under the Active Directory category, we now have that same adc.talabs.local, just like we do for physical. So that's how easy it is to register a source. And again, these are the various different sources.
Typically, sources are considered to be like internal within your network. But again, we are protecting Office 365. So from here, you would register Office 365 as a source from sources. But don't forget that we had the external targets, which were more right here, which were more for those cloud providers for archival and um, tiering data. So that is registering right now and that has finished. So we finished registering that. So next up, let's take a look at creating a policy. So I'm gonna click on policies. As you can see, we have a couple of policies already. Out of the box, you're gonna get the silver, bronze, and gold policy. Although any policy that's in here, you don't have to use them. You can modify them, you can edit them, do what you want. You can create as many policies as you want for whatever your purposes are. Uh, we also have this other one, this silver policy to replicate the CoECO2. But just to show you how quick and easy it is to create a policy, I'm going to call one just test to show you. We can say, okay, I want to do dailies for 30 days. Retry options, retry three times, wait five minutes per. Now over here is where we have all the other settings that we can select within a policy. So here, this icon is for extended retention. So for example, if I click on that for my extended retention, okay, I'm doing dailies for 30 days. Maybe I wanna do weeklies and I want to save them for a month. And then I'm gonna do it one more time and I'm gonna say, one annual and I'm gonna save it for three years. So not only can you set up your immediate retention, but also your long-term retention as well. If you're doing a bare metal recovery of a, of a physical server, you do require integration and a license for Christie bare metal recovery or BMR. So this is where you set that up. This icon here is cloud spin. Now cloud spin gives us the capability to where we can back up a VMware virtual machine and then we can take that backed, backed up snapshot of that VM, and then we can send it out to AWS, GCP, or Azure. And what we will do, so let, again, it's specifically for VM or VMs. That is going to be a VMDK file. That is the virtual hard drive for it. For example, if we were going to want to put a copy of that out into Azure, we would convert that VMDK to an AHD file. And then that copy of that VM would reside out on Azure for uh, backup purposes in the event that, let's say that a hurricane comes through, wipes out your on-prem data center, your VM can now be spun up within Azure. If it's uh, AWS, uh, it would be converted to an AMI image, for example. Here we have periodic full backups. Now, the way Cohesi does it is the first time we do a backup, it's a full, and then we do incrementals forever. Each one of our incrementals uh, have all the metadata. So basically, they're just like a full. So really, periodic fulls are not necessary. This is more so just for people that are using legacy solutions that are used to doing those periodic fulls. So if they want to do that, they can do that. If we're dealing with a database and we're creating a policy for a database, we can do a log backup. Here we can do a blackout window. So we can say from Monday through Friday, I from 12 a.m. to I'm going to say 6 a.m. 6 a.m. I don't want this policy to run. So here is where we can replicate. So I can click on replication. And again, we have that Cohesity O2. We can also replicate to AWS right now, but I'm gonna say remote cluster. It's gonna be that Cohesity O2 cluster. And I'm gonna say every time this protection shop runs, we're gonna do it and retain it for 14 days and only replicate successful runs. So there we go. There's a bunch of options. Also, uh, we can cloud archive. So out to GCP, Azure, AWS, and an S3 compatible provider, we can again do this long-term archive if we choose out to them, as well as, again, we talked about cloud spin. So that's how easy it is to create a policy. And I'm just going to click save. I'm not going to really use it, but that's how easy it is to create a policy. So there's our test policy. And again, you can, you can delete it. You can clone it, make modifications of the clone. You can go in and make edits on any existing one. So we've done that. So now let's go to a and create a protection job. So as you see, we have some protection jobs already. 
but we're going to go ahead and create a protection job. So I'm going to click the plus sign. So here's all the different options that we have for a protection job. Virtual servers, physical, either block-based or file-based, one of our views. Now, a cohesity view is essentially a share. Again, we can act as a NAS, so we can present S3, NFS, and SB protocols all at once or individually. So we can back up one of those views. So if you're using us as an as, we can back up that information. SQL servers, Oracle database, remote adapter, pure storage volumes, generic NAS, again, Office 365 Active Directory, as well as now Amazon RDS. So let's just do a virtual server. We're going to point to the appropriate source, which is going to be my vCenter. Now, with VMware environments specifically, we're calling the VMware APIs. So we have a couple of different views at which we can look at everything in that vCenter. So we're pulling everything from vCenter through their API, so it's going to look very similar. So here is more of a physical layout of the hierarchy. Then we also had to have a folder view. So this would be just like going into vCenter and looking at uh, templates and folders. So as you can see, we've got the different folders here. Then we also have just a straight up VM listing where just the VMs, no host clusters, anything like that. Then we also have vCenter tags. Now this is specifically to vCenter. If you've created some sort of tags, which we have in this demo environment, I could say, you know, I want to do all Linux VMs. So obviously I would have had to put a vCenter tag on all my VMs. So we have that option as well to do vCenter tags when connecting to a vCenter. I'm just going to go back to this folder view here. I'm going to do this CentOS VM. Now, one really nice feature that we have here is this auto protect. It's a shield with the A. When I click on that, you're going to see it, it turns on, turns it blue, says auto protected. Now, what this is doing in this particular case, I am turning it on at this Linux folder level. So from here on out, I will protect this CentOS VM. If in the future, if anybody adds additional virtual machines into this Linux folder within vCenter, that will automatically get included in this protection job and will automatically be protected. You can also click on the shield next to a particular VM to exclude. So for example, if we wanted to, if we did auto protect up at this biz app folder level and I didn't want to do the analytics server, I could click on it there, but yet the rest of them will be done. I'm going to go ahead uh, and uncheck that because I don't want to do that. So this particular protection job, we're just going to do everything in the Linux folder. I'm going to click save. I'm going to give it a name. I'm just going to call it sent OS. We're going to select the particular policy that we want. I mean, we can select a previously created policy, or we can even, if we want to do a new one, we can do it right from here. I'm going to go ahead and do the silver replicate to Cohesity 2 So as you can see, it's pulling the policy. Here's all the information that we set up as well as replicating. You can have multiple storage domains. If you do, you would select it. But in our case, we only have this default storage domain. So that's the one that's only available. We also have some additional settings. As you can see, you can do an end date. You can do QoS policies. Um, you can do exclusions on drives, app consistency backups, indexing, alerts, priorities, key factor on SLAs. You can edit these, XL, these SLAs. So I could say full should take no more than 60 minutes and an incremental should take no more than 30 minutes. A special note on this, you could have a backup job that completes successfully but fails the SLA. The SLA is only related to these time frames that you have allotted, either the default one that was already in there, or if you've gone in like I just have and set a very specific time frame, that just means that it didn't complete in the time that you have allotted in this setting. So I'm going to click protect. And there we have the sent OS protection job. And keep in mind, you can create as many protection jobs as you want. You can put whatever policies that you want to them. It's totally up to you as to how many protection jobs, what's in those protection jobs, how many VMs, uh, how many views or what have you. So as you can see, now that I've refreshed, this protection job has kicked off and this is going to run. Okay, so that's how it is to create a protection job. So now what I'd like to do is show how to do a recovery. So we're going to go to recoveries. We're going to click on the plus sign again. Just to show you real quick, I'm going to click on files and folders. Now, 
every, both in this search at the top of the user interface, as well as here in this case, doing a restore of a file or a folder, we have very much like a Google-like search engine. Here, we can use wildcards. So if I didn't know the name of a file, I could essentially just put that wildcard in there and it'll list all the files on all the different protect that are in all the VMs and the protection jobs, any of the views that we have. I'm going to, so I'm going to look for a file called SSNS and it's a text file. And I'm going to click enter. So here you're going to see that we found this file. Again, keep in mind, this is a demo environment. So it's just showing this one, but it shows what VM it's on which is the CentOS VM, it's a virtual machine, and it's in that protection group virtual. Now, once our protection job for that CentOS VM that we just created finishes, it would then also showing up for the protection group of CentOS. But just to let you know, we can click on that. And when we do that, we have a choice of all the different snapshots that are available. By default, selects the most recent one. So we can recover it back to the original server and overwrite it, or we can download it right to our desktop if we choose to. So this is an example where this might be a neat feature where to give, again, using our back with Active Directory and our roles to give your help desk the ability to do a restore of files and folders only. So that's files and folders. So let's go back to recoveries. And this time let's do a VM. So we're gonna do a VM. And again, I'm gonna type in sent OS. So as you see here, uh, the protection job virtual and then the sent OS VM itself. So we can pick it from either one. I'm just gonna say, let's pick this one. We're gonna hit recover options. We can do it back to the original location to a new location. We can select which snapshot we wanna do. So if there's multiple snapshots, but again, we're going to just do that since it's the latest one. Recovery options uh, for the network. We can do the network unattached or you can do it attached. There's some different options here. We can rename it. So I wanna do, I'm gonna rename it and I'm gonna say instead of copy, I'm gonna say restored power state. I'm gonna say I want it to be off. Continue on error, no. Cluster interface, have it automatically select. Sure, we'll leave that. And then the task name, you can rename it if you like otherwise. And then we're going to click start recovery. So this recovery job is going to start. And because all of our snapshots have all the metadata, we are simply mounting that snapshot onto the Cohesity data platform as the first step of the recovery. And then in the second step, once it's fully recovered and up and running, then we're going to vMotion that back to the original data store. So if I go over to my vCenter environment, you're going to see that I already have this restored CentOS VM and it's already going through and starting the vMotion back to the original data store. I'm gonna close out this other Cohesity cluster here, we don't need that. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna let that run. Next up, what I'd like to do is show you test dev. So while that's running, I'm gonna do test dev. What test dev is, is ability to clone. Again, this can, as you see here, if you click on clone, it can be clone a view, clone a VM, clone a database. So we're gonna go ahead and clone a VM. But the one thing I wanna clarify is the difference between a restore and a clone process. So as I just stated, a recovery, step number one is to recover the VM, Cohesity data platform. So it's running on our platform. And then step two is it will vMotion the VMs over to the original data store that it, the original VM was on. A clone, the difference is, is that we make a clone of it and it stays on the data platform. There is no vMotion to push it back to where the original data store of where that original VM was. So there's a subtle difference there. So I'm gonna say clone VM. I'm gonna say sent OS again, do the same one. I'm gonna go ahead and select it. Again, this is a virtual protection job. This is the VM itself. Click OK. So again, if we wanted to select a particular snapshot, we could click change here and select it. I'm just going to do the latest and greatest. We're going to preserve the tags and the attributes. 
We do need to select the vCenter source. So vCenter, we're going to select the resource pool, the VM folder, I'm going to say Linux, and then the view is our lab view. And this time I do want to rename it, but this time instead of copy, I'm going to say clone. And again, I want to detach the network. I want to leave the VM powered off, so I'm going to select that. I'm going to automatically select the interface again, and I'm going to click Finish. So that process is going to start. I'm going to click back on this. It will start running. If I go back over to my vCenter environment, you're going to see that now, boom, there is the clone dash sent OS VM already restored. So going back over to the Coecity interface, I'm going to click Refresh since it finished doing the clone action. I want it to say successful. So there we go. It said it was a success. Now, another difference between restore and uh, cloning is cloning has a cleanup process. Again, cloning is running the VM on, uh, on our Cohesity data platform. Okay. It does not get moved back to a data store. The cloning process, as you can see here, we have the ability to do a nice cleanup act afterwards. So we have this teardown capability. You may ask, you know, why might we want to clone a VM? Well, here's an example. When I was an operational IT engineer, I used to have to do patching at one point in time. When I was patching, typically you don't want to install a bunch of patches such as a Microsoft or Adobe or Flash patches on production servers without testing them first. So what you can do is you can take a subset of your production VMs, back them up, make a clone of them, install the patch, check to make sure it doesn't break the OS or in your applications on the server, and then blow them away afterwards. As well, another use case, developers. Developers typically want to have a one-for-one -one light copy of what's running in production so that they can update their code, test it out, make sure it works, and then again, blow it away afterwards. So again, clone has this ability to tear down. So if I click on tear down, I'm going to say yes, tear down. And if I go back over to vCenter, you can see that that clone VM is no longer there anymore. So it has already removed it from the Cohesity platform and removed it from vCenter. So that is cloning a VM. So now what I'd like to do is go to file services and go to views. As I said, we can act as a NAS. So we have the NAS use case. We can present SMB, NFS, and S3 protocols all at once or individually. So we can create our views, which are basically a share. And then while we're doing it, and I'll show you an example, we're gonna create a view. I'm gonna say that this is an SMB view. I'm gonna select SMB only. Best practice is if you only need a single protocol, select that protocol. You can select whether case sensitive or not. You can give it description. You can give it uh, some QoS policies for performance. You can do security, dedupe compression quotas. You can do data lock, um, file filtering, SMB options, whether they're browsable or not, access-based enumeration. So again, from uh, think about this in the sense of from Windows, where if they don't have permissions to a folder, they won't see it. Uh, you can turn on and off encryption. So again, a lot of different options here, as well as share level permissions and TFS permissions, as well as we can run Clam AV to do run antivirus against a view. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to click create a view. Keep it simple. I'm going to go back to views. So here is my SMB view that I just created. If I click on these three dots here, I'm going to say copy the SMB path. And if I open up Windows Explorer, I'm going to go ahead and paste that path in there and click enter. And as you can see, we now have access to that share. Now keep in mind the way we have it in this environment is it's wide open. I didn't set up any particular permissions or anything like that. But understand that when you create these views, no matter what protocol you're doing, you can set up um, permissions as deemed appropriate. NFS, NTFS permissions, whatever you need to do, you can set up permissions that only the appropriate people have access. It's not um, something that is only wide open to where anybody can access it all the time. So that is creating a view. You can also do uh, global whitelists as well to where you can put a subnet in to where only people on this subnet can access these shares. You can also disable authentication for SMB shares. So you can get very granular on the permissions, who can access it, who can see it, and everything else.
Now, data migration, uh, this is a great example. We make it very easy to do data migrations. So for example, say you have a MC Isilon or maybe a NetApp NAS, and you're getting a new hardware, you know, the current hardware that you have is five years old, you're getting ready to replace it. We can point to that as a source. We can do a backup of it, and then we can then restore that data to the new physical appliance that you have. So we make data migration very simple. We have the antivirus here again, if we're running Clam IV as, an, as a containerized app on our platform, which is an option, we can do that. Speaking of containerized apps, uh, going to the marketplace, if we go to all apps, it will take us directly out to our marketplace. As you can see here, we have Cohesity branded apps that we've created, as well as third party apps such as Splunk, Sentinel One, Tenable IO, Clam AV, Christie, Bare Metal Recovery. The third party apps, with the exception of Clam AV, all require that third party license to use it. Uh, the Cohesity branded apps, all of them are free to use. So you can simply click on get app, download that to your Cohesity platform. That particular app will run as a containerized app on the data, on your data platform. So just to let you know, out of the box, we have three apps that are automatically installed. And all you have to do is click Run App. We have a video compressor, which is self-explanatory, password detector as well, and then Pattern Finder. Those are all the different apps that we currently have. Keep in mind that that marketplace over time will add new Cohesity branded as well as we are working with other third-party uh, software companies to add their containerized version of their apps to run on our platform as well. We also have reporting. So we have a bunch of canned reports. If you click on this drop down here, you can see all the different canned reports that we have. So storage consumed by servers, let's just select this one for example. This is a nice little graph. We can calculate the variance over uh, a specific amount of days. Now keep in mind, again, this environment has been running literally for like an hour. So um, we're not gonna really see a variance, but you can select the different type of sources. You can select just a single vCenter, physical server, Active Directory, what have you, uh, particular protection groups, storage domains. So you can get gr very granular uh, within this particular report on, to see what information you want. Now, as you can see, you can email the report to you. You can download it to a CSV. You can also schedule emails to send reports to you. So if you have to send maybe a capacitor report to your boss every Friday, you could schedule that report to be sent to you on Friday to pass to your boss. So that's reports. Again, one of the side note we have a reporting app. So out in the marketplace, I don't know if you saw, but we have a reporting app that's using J reports. These are canned reports. As I said, you can't modify these, but with the J with the reporting app, you can go in and create very customized apps if you choose to. System, just uh, again, general system overview of different alerts, where your storage is at, for example, for your cluster, your storage domain, who the consumers are, performance data, advanced diagnostic. This is something that is very, very detailed. If you ever call in for support, uh, the tech support may actually go in and run some of this advanced diagnostics right from here. This is something you can play in. I'm not going to really get into it because it's really deep on what it can pull as far as information, as well as audit logs so that you can see who's doing what within the interface. So that sums up our Cohesity user interface. And again, this is version 6.5.0. Hopefully this gives you a really good overview of what our capabilities are within the Cohesity user interface for 6.5, how easy it is to connect to different sources, whether they're an external or, or an internal source to your network, as well as how easy it is to create policies, how to create protection jobs, how to do recoveries, clones of a VM files. You can even do it for databases, as well as a real quick overview of our marketplace apps that you can download and use on our platform. So again, hopefully uh, this gives you a good overview. And with that, I thank you very much for watching this and have a great day.